He's walking through this place right now. He's walking through this place right now. Oh, he's healing this morning. He's healing this morning. There's power. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in your name, Jesus. You're healing. You're healing. Come on, you got to reach for it. God wants to touch you this morning. God wants to touch you this morning. But you got to want it. You got to want it. The Lord's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself in. He's not going to force himself in. You got to let him in. Lord, we need you. Father, you have shown mercy for every single moment of my life. The fountains of your forgiveness Reflected in the light of your eyes All I ever wanted was you All I ever needed was you So take the world, take it all Forgive me, Jesus I've been forever convinced i never find a love like this so take the world take it all
never find a love quite like this. So take the world, take it all, but give me Jesus. I only want all I want is your presence, God. All we need is your presence. Lift it up. I'm not enough. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? All we want is you, Jesus. Cause all I want is all of you.
Hey there, my name is Obi, and I serve as a young adults leader here at Without Walls Church. Before we get into this week's message, I just want to tell you thank you for being part of our online family. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button, as we want to come alongside you to be a blessing to your life as you continue to grow in Christ. May this week's message be a blessing and an encouragement as you continue to go forward. But why I'm here today is that you walk away a little bit more educated, a little bit more focused, and a little bit more committed to a plan. A plan, a plan that God has for you so that you can live a fruitful life. You can be more productive and you can be thriving versus just surviving. In Ephesians 5.16, it guides us to make the most out of every opportunity. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is how do we use our time for opportunities? So the title of my message and really part two of what Elizabeth talked about is, it's time, who's in control? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, God. Yeah, we pray that you just download to us what you want us specifically to hear on how we use our time and how you guide us into the future, God. Yeah, we pray that we forget the past, but we use it as evidence of where we are today, but that we create a whole new future, God, that's solely focused on you. We thank you for this time today, God, in your precious name, amen. All right, so going back to the Watchman Bible study, this ended a couple weeks ago, I'm sorry, a couple months ago, and we had an incredible time. We had 40 guys there for eight weeks, which was amazing, something we haven't seen before. And we spent a lot of time talking about time, and it's a precious resource. We all have the same amount, yet we all use it slightly differently. And as we were talking through the Bible study, we kind of got this, we'll call it a macho feeling of like, well, you just need to wake up earlier and like get in the Word and pray. And, you know, this is the easiest way to do it. And I said it. And ever since I said it and we were talking, the Lord started to download to me like, hey, are you sure that's where you want to encourage and point people towards? And I'm like, well, Lord, I'm asking them, telling them, to spend time in your Word. Is that not it? And he said, it's deeper than that. So I said, Okay. So I went on a journey over the last couple months having a ton of coffees and one-on-one conversations with the individual guys in our church. Incredible conversations. We have such a great group of guys that just want to connect, that just want to have a relationship. And I got the opportunity to do that. But the topic of the conversation was about time, and it's about them, and it's about understanding them a little bit more. I'm not going to talk about them. I am going to speak for myself, though. So I started this year saying, I've got all the right intentions, I'm going to spend daily time in the word, in prayer, seeking after God. And it was the right thing to do, and I'm still doing it today. And I absolutely love it. But I did find myself very early on, January, February, almost feeling like I was just checking the box. Like, okay, I got my word time, my prayer, now let's go do our thing. Let's go get into work or life or whatever, and I felt like I was just going through the motions. And I was hard on myself, or I'd miss a day, skip a day, and I was super hard on myself. And it's like, man, I just wanna know God more, but I can't even commit to this. Or I shortcutted him some time. And then the busyness of the day happens, right? So then you're running to work, you're getting ready, you're jumping flights, you're boom, 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 all these phone calls, right? And as the Bible study started to end, I started to realize, you know what? This is kind of the world we live in. Our attention really isn't there. So I got a couple stats for you. 2024 average American, so this room here, I hope. Uh, Average social media time, two hours and 15 minutes a day, the equivalent of 67 hours per month. We spend over three hours a day or 90 hours a month on various streaming TV platforms or movies. The average American spends six hours a day on the internet. The average attention span of a person is eight seconds this year. It was 12 seconds in 2000. This one I found super interesting. Half of mobile phone users today, that's 3.6 billion people, don't even text anymore. They use the voice text or the voice search. 3.6 billion people. But this is the one that shocked me the most. When we are distracted for a task we have at hand that we're in the middle of doing and we get distracted, it takes us 23 minutes to come back to that same level of attention and focus on that task. 23 minutes when you get distracted. 
So the next question you're asking is, well, how many times do I get distracted? Average American is 56 distractions in a day. I said the same thing. I was shocked. Even this. So we'll throw up the first visual on a website. So everybody uses websites. But what I found super interesting as I was looking through this, this is how people read web pages, with the red being where my most amount of visual attention. There's a ton of studies on this and how companies set up websites. But this is how we read information. We just kind of quickly hit the top information, and then as you can see, as we move down the page, we just kind of lose attention, or we're jumping around. What's interesting about this is, didn't you search for this website to find something that you needed? You spent the time to say, hey, I'm curious about this. I want to know about this. So I search for it, and then you go, bum, 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 bum. Okay, I got it. And you take off. It's interesting that our time, while it's important to us to look we don't spend the time to understand. So enter in the world today of rapidly evolving artificial intelligence. So my career today is focused on technology and AI and how we best support the 3,000 people at my company across the US and Canada and how they're using the technology. AI industry today, in general, $621 billion is what the industry is stated to be today. And in 2032, that will surpass $2.7 trillion. The crazier part is that the disruption of AI on the world is supposed to be 10 times larger than the introduction of the internet. You think about how much the internet has brought to us, good and bad, and AI is going to bring 10 times more. But here, what's the main driving force behind AI? It's a time savings tool. Why is it a time savings tool? Because it commoditizes information. It allows us to be smarter without actually having to go to school or get that degree. I just need something right now. It's a personal assistant in a life filled with busyness. But I want to go back to that Watchman Bible study because as I continue to think about this story really over the last couple of months, I realized that in this fast-paced world where our, we use our time and where our time is consumed is super important and we don't even realize the areas in which we're wasting it. Our time reflects our priorities, our values, and our goals in life. And the Bible does have a lot to say about time. So we're going to look at a handful today starting in Ephesians 5. All of Ephesians 5 really covers guidance on how to live our lives. The most of it speaks to doing the things that please the Lord and not those of evil or darkness. But verse 15 and 16, which we're going to look at here, speaks to a broader message on how we should do it. So be careful, got that verse there? Okay, thanks. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. So opportunities are gonna be presented, we gotta use the most of them. The amplified version actually says to live carefully, meaning to live a life with honor, purpose, and courage. And to be wise, which means to be sensible, intelligent, and discerning. This verse reminds us that time is limited and valuable, things that we know. I change those words up a little bit. It speaks to using our limited time for valuable purposes. If we look at Proverbs 13, so before I dive into the verses, Proverbs, if you haven't dug into Proverbs, it's a very interesting book of the Bible because it's about instruction. It's very clear guidance on how to use our lives. It actually starts in verse 2 by putting action into words. It's talking about here's the instruction that you may know this and then you may act on it. King Solomon wrote Proverbs. Um, if you don't know who King Solomon is, he's the second son of David and Bathsheba, right? We know what happened to the first one, but he's the second son of David and Bathsheba. He's also the wisest man that ever lived. He's also the richest man that ever lived. As a matter of fact, today, King Solomon's net worth would be $2 trillion dollars. So this guy had everything, needed nothing, no cares in the world, no anything. Yet he wrote a book that is literally the manuscript of life. So we're going to look at Proverbs 13, verse 3. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. The godly hate lies. The wicked cause shame and disgrace. 
Godliness guards the path of the blameless, but the evil are misled by sin. Some who are poor pretend to be rich. Others who are rich pretend to be poor. The rich can pay ransom for their lives, but the poor can't even get threatened. I don't know what that means. If anybody knows, let me know. The life of the godly is full of light and joy, but the light of the wicked will be snuffed out. Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappear, but wealth from hard work grows over time. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is the tree of life. In verse 13, the last one, people who despise advice are asking for trouble. Those who respect a command will succeed. King Solomon here is talking about hard work. He's talking about focused efforts. And he's talking about seeking advice to live a life full of joy and to live a godly life. As I read it, I make things as simple as possible. And what I found was he reiterated numerous times, hard work, don't take shortcuts, don't waste your time. Set dreams, build a plan, and work hard towards that plan. Full stop. Let's look at Proverbs 3. So we're going to roll back a little bit in the Bible, but Proverbs 3, verse 1. It's King Solomon again. He said, my child, never forget the things that I have taught you. Store in my commands, my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years, and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder and write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing in your body and the strength in your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything that you produce. This is what Mel was talking about. And then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. The Lord corrects those that he loves, just as a father or a mother or a parent corrects a child in whom he delights. See how many times he did the if-then statements? If this, then this will happen. That's what I was talking about, being the manuscript of life. It's written out super clear. There's only a handful of things that we have to focus on. It's also screaming of not running a life from thing to thing to thing or busy event to busy event, being a mile wide for everybody and an inch deep. It talks about having an abundant and healthy and satisfied life. He tells us don't lose our loyalty and our kindness, but rather let them define us and other people will see that. He tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and to submit to him in our ways and in our decisions. To honor the Lord with our income and we will be abundantly blessed. And the last one, and probably the hardest, is to accept the discipline and the correction from the Lord. Because as a loving father disciplines his child, so does God discipline us. It's just to learn from our mistakes. One of the last verses I'm gonna show you here is Proverbs 21. Again, King Solomon. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines the heart. The Lord is more pleased when we do what is right and just than when we offer sacrifices. Haughty eyes and a proud heart and evil actions are all sin. Good planning and hard work leads to prosperity. Hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Solomon's talking here about life planning, and he's been talking about it all through Proverbs. That's what leads to wealth. That's where it leads to focusing our time and not wasting our time or not just being urgent on things. He compares the diligent and the hasty person where the diligent person makes plans and follows them with care and is patient. That's the hardest part. Like Elizabeth talked about last week, you have to water trees and then be patient to watch them grow their next crop. The hasty person is just looking for shortcuts. What can I get right now? And how do I avoid spending effort? In all of this, God examines our heart and our motives, our intentions. 
there's a ton in the Bible that God has given us to how to live our lives. And I think Proverbs is just a great example. You have to flip around to some different uh, translations, but all of a sudden you'll start to unlock, oh, here's how to live life said by the richest and the wisest guy ever. I feel like I should probably do that. It's not a bad idea. But life is full of urgent and important tasks. These are the things that keep us busy, keep us maybe distracted. If you go to the bookstore today, you're going to find a ton of similarities to what you just saw in Proverbs. They're all over the place. Um, what was it? Four, uh, four hour work week? That seems fantastic. I doubt it's going to work, but like, that sounds great. That's one of the books out there. Um, if somebody's doing that, let me know. Um, but there is one book, the simplest book that I have found, and I've used it quite a bit. I deviate from it. I read it early in my career. I reflect on it often. It's by Stephen Covey, and it's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So I'm going to pull up a visual here, and we're going to walk through this, because it's so simple on how we use our time. So I'm going to walk you through this real quick. We're going to start with the top left, but you'll see these boxes are organized in terms of urgent and not urgent, and on the left-hand side, important and not important. Box number one, these are our must-do things, right? So these are our work deadlines, our priorities. These are the emergencies that come up, right? I got a flat tire, I got to go to the doctor, I got the hospital, boom, 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 all these things that we absolutely have to take care of. They require our urgent attention. If you drop down to box three, these are the reactive things. So these are our unimportant calls, our emails, these are the interruptions that we talked about earlier, other people's problems, right, where they dump them on you. If you're, if you're in an office, right, somebody, hey, you got a second? Like, that's a, somebody else's problem. Be like, no, you got to take that out there. Um, just busyness in general. Hey, let's schedule every minute of our Saturday. Let's schedule every minute of our Sunday. Let's just run, 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 run. And really, it's about overcommitting the activities. Jump to the box on the right, box number four. These are our time wasters. So this is where we spend excessive television, endless phone calls, social media. This is where we procrastinate on the things that we know are probably going to take more time. And it's like, oh, I'll do that later. So I'm just going to procrastinate. I'm going to get horizontal on the couch. I'm just going to watch TV. Let it veg over me. These are our time wasters. Obviously, it's clear where I'm going. It's the bright green box, box number two. This is our growth box. This is where you're doing your planning, your goal setting. This is your weekly tasks. So what do I got to accomplish this week to make traction, to make movement? This is where you spend time to exercise. These are your relationships, the ones that are important to you, that are edifying, that are building you up. These are the things that set up your future. What's interesting about this model is it's like, okay, this doesn't, this helps me understand maybe where I'm spending my time, but how does it actually look in real life? Well, let me tell you. Most people wake up on Monday and focus on, here's the must-do things I need today. I have to get done. These three big projects, whatever it may be, I must do these. And then when we get done with some of those or almost done with some of those, we jump into the, let me just answer some emails real quick. Let me just follow up on this phone call. Let me go do this, right? These are the reactive things. I'm trying to fill in this extra time. And at the end of the day, we're so exhausted that we just jump into this box four of like, oh, I'm exhausted. I've got no time. I'm just going to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll or watch TV. What's interesting in the world we are in today is that box four is really starting to show up kind of throughout. But people jump and live their work lives between box one, three, four, and then they jump, the alarm goes off, they jump to the next one, three, four on Tuesday. And day in and day out, they go through the same thing, box one, three, four. And then a time period passes and they look back and they go, how did I get here? What is going on? Why has nothing changed? Why have I not been promoted? How come my finances are the same? What's going on with my relationship? I can't understand it. It's like, well, let me see where I've been spending my time. I've been focusing on the must-dos. I've been handling the reactive, other people's stuff. And then I've been wasting my time. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying social media is bad and we should delete it. Uh, should we? Uh, that's your decision. But time wasters are not bad. It's about overusing how you're wasting your time is bad. Anything in moderation is okay. Anything excessively used is bad. 
But the question is, is where are you spending these important yet not urgent time, this growth box? Are you saying today, hey, let me plan, let me begin to think about where I'm going. What are the next three feet that I need to accomplish? We're gonna celebrate, high five, and we're gonna go on to the next one. I just want you to reflect on this. And I also wanna recall what Elizabeth said last week. She spoke about pruning and reshaping the branches for the next season. And if season after season, again, you're yielding the same crop or the same thing, then you have to evaluate where you're spending your time. Think about this, okay, so a fresh body of water, right? This could be something like a, a river. It's moving, it's flowing, it sounds powerful, it's fresh, right? New water's coming in, pushing old water out. We've all seen a river before. I'm not explaining anything in new. But contrast that to a body of water, like a pond or a lake. It sits stagnant, there's no movement. It's just settled. I'd even go as far as to say at times it looks peaceful. It looks quiet and it looks serene. It looks comfortable. Did you know that a body of water with no movement sitting in the sunlight grows bacteria in two days? And after two weeks, it's actually fatal if consumed. Bacteria grows at a rapid pace and the only way to get rid of it is to massively shock the system with chemicals or drain, clean, and refill. And any of my Arizona pool lovers in the summer said amen, because we know what that's all about. Um, maybe the most important thing that I'm gonna say today, overgrown and stagnant circumstances without action or movement can lead to de decay and undesirable growth. It's only a matter of time and how you spend it will determine your future. Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard actually once said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Okay, that seems simple, but to me, if I reflect and look backwards, does it make sense of where I'm at today? And if I'm not happy where I'm at today, then I have to start and change something today so that when I get there, I don't look backwards and be dissatisfied. Something's gotta change. God tells us to use our time purposely and with discernment, to concentrate at the tasks at hand and not worry about tomorrow, but to plan for the future. I'll go back to it again, but a lack of time with God potentially means just time needs to be prioritized. We all have the right intentions. There's not one person here that says, I don't want to spend time with God. But we just get sometimes disorganized. We just lose sight of what we're doing, and that's okay, because there's grace in that. We say, hey, we'll just, you know what? I'll get started again on Monday. That's okay. I'll get started again on Monday. We can all agree again, there is more opportunity, and God says in the book of James that if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. We all want that. So the question is, what's stopping you? Go back to that Bible study, a Watchman's Bible study a couple months ago, I made that recommendation, hey, just wake up earlier, and I realized, how are people spending their time in general? Is it just a misappropriated agenda? Yes, you can start early. You can wake up early and you can spend time in the, in the Bible. But is it a lifestyle too? How are you praying throughout the day? And, and that sounds complicated. It's like, man, how am I gonna remember all these things? We're gonna talk about it. There's actually a couple steps here. But as I'm closing, and Sterling, you can come up, I do want to share some of those thoughts now. First, start with evaluating just simply where you're spending your time. I showed you that four box. Is it important and urgent, or is it just wasteful? Are you stuck in a routine, in a season? Even if that routine and season is yielding decent, I've got enough money, I don't have to do anything. Don't touch it, don't move. That's a routine, that's a season. If it's not where you wanna be, you have to address it. Just evaluate where you're at and understand where you're spending your time and where you want to be spending your time. From there, it just starts with one small step. It's going to vary day by day. And that's the beauty of this, is that it's not about religion. Every day from five to six, you have to be in the Bible and work your way through Genesis to Revelation. That's not what this is. Write yourself some notes. 
Post them around your house. Post them in your bathroom while you're brushing your teeth or in your car as you're driving to work or on your desk when you're at work. Little things that just remind you, A, how's my demeanor? Am I showing Christ? And then B, God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to drive this car to work. God, thank you for revealing to me. God, what do you want to tell me today? Where do you want me to go today? Just quick reminders, even something small, like a bracelet on your wrist, something that's always in your eyesight that's just reminding you to do one thing and just talk to God. It's important here that you surround yourself with positive influences and you seek guidance from them. Balance time with those who build you up and that are important in your growth and in your future of where you're going. My mom told me this, two things growing up, and I've never forgotten them. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And the second one is, it's easier to pull somebody off a ladder than up a ladder. Speaking specifically about who you're spending your time with or considerable time with. And the last thing I'm gonna say here is that this isn't about just checking the box. It isn't about just opening the Bible. It's so much simpler than that. As a matter of fact, I had a great conversation with one of my dear friends. And he said, so how do I start reading the Bible? And I said, well, just start in Genesis. He's like, yeah, this seems boring. I'm like, that's okay. I'm like, what Bible stories did you know first? What, what have you heard? Like, well, David and Goliath. Okay. Have you read it yourself? Or do you just remember what they said? Well, I don't think I've read it myself. Okay. So that's my last step for you. Those Bible stories that you heard, those are visual reminders. You've recalled them after so many years. Have you gone back and read them yourself? Because here's what you're gonna find. You read stories like David and Goliath and Jonah and the life of Jesus, the death and the resurrection. Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who washed Jesus' feet with her hair. These are stories about faith. These are stories about love and the love of God and the power of his grace. When you read them through your own eyes, you're gonna get a whole new revelation that is specific to you. And so if you're asking the question, okay, you know what? I'm gonna start. Just start with the, the verses that you've heard, the stories that you heard when you were a kid or somebody else told you or Pastor Ken said it weeks ago. Just start there. Read it yourself because it's gonna be a page turner. I guarantee it. And then you go into prayer. And immediately we say, okay, well, here's all the things I got going on in my life, God. Yeah, those are important to him. He wants to hear those. The way you start in prayer is, God, thank you for the story of David. Thank you for his faith and his obedience when it didn't look possible that you just gave him a few stones and told him to throw. God, give me the faith and the obedience like David. God, let me be humble like Mary to wash your feet and to use all of my earnings, God, to rec represent and reflect you. God, thank you for these stories that will stick with me forever. And teach me these things, God. God, for all of these decisions in my life, I need your help. David had decisions to pick up rocks and when to throw. I know that you're the creator of all, God, and these decisions are easier for you, but I need help here, God. It looks something like that. It's not complicated. The last verse I'm gonna show you here, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. We are to pray about everything, thanking him for what he's already accomplished in our lives. And that is what leaves us with peace. If you're anything like me that said, hey, you know what, I messed up. Saturday, I messed up, but I'm gonna start again on Monday. I do have really good news for you. Tomorrow's Monday. <laughs> and we have an opportunity to start again. Thank you for joining us today. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. And if you wanna stay up to date with everything that's going on Without Walls, download our app today, Without Walls AZ. And if you wanna give, there's also a give button to give. We hope to see you soon. 
Have a great blessed week.